Okay, now let me start the economic session. I'm Ipe Fujiwara of the Australian University and the Keio University. So um, after long years of neglect, uh, Japanese economy has now some global attentions. And uh, we have observed some changes in the Japanese economy and also no changes at all in the Japanese economy. So the, <laughs> and, uh, this update is a great chance to discuss the current state of the Japanese economy. And, uh, we are really fortunate to be able to have a three distinguished uh, uh, researchers on the Japanese economy. Uh, Professor David Weinstein from Columbia University and uh, from the United States. And uh, Professor Jenny Corbett of the Australian National University, naturally from Australia. And uh, Professor Masahiko Takeda uh, of the Hitotsubashi University from Japan. So the, we have a global view on the Japanese economy. And also the, uh, being very busy with the pro vice chancellor job at the Australian National University, Jenny still re re uh, maintains her position at the University of Oxford, in particular at the Nissan Institute of the Japanese Studies. So we can cover the views from US, Europe, uh, Australia, and Japan. So it's really great, great opportunity. So uh, let me briefly introduce the speakers. Uh, David is Carl Sharp, Professor of the Japanese Economy and the Director of the Research at the Center of Japanese Economy and the Business of Columbia University. The Center of, uh, on Japanese Economy and the Business of Columbia University is the world's leading research center on the Japanese economy. And also, David is very well known as the leading academic economist in the field of economic trade uh, with many great academic publications in top academic journals. And uh, Jenny, as you know, the leading researcher on the Japanese economy in Australia. Uh, before taking the job of the pro, uh, the pro vice chancellor, Jenny was the director of the Australian Japan Research Center. Also, Jenny has been the main central economist, has been the main economist at the Nissan Institute of the Japanese Studies of University of Oxford. So now we have the top economist of the Columbia CJEB, and a, a top economist at the Nissan Institute of the Japanese Studies, and also we have a Shiro Armstrong of the, uh, the economist, top economist at Australian Japan Research Center. We can have the views from the world well, top three institutions on the Japanese economy today. <laughs> so I hope you, you contribute something. Okay. And, uh, uh, Masahiko is the professor of Hitotsubashi University in Tokyo, one of the best universities in Japan, which focuses on the social sciences. Uh, before taking his position, Masahiko was the deputy director of the, of the Asia and the Pacific Department of the International Monetary Fund. And I heard that he was also the mission chief for Australia in IMS Article 4 consultation. So therefore, the several of the participants may have met or discussed with Masahiko in the IMF's consultation. If you don't like the IMF consultation, it may be a nice idea to talk with Masahiko. <laughs> Not in this session, after the session. So the, and uh, we have a, that's a perfect person to discuss the current Japanese economic issues from Japanese as well as international point of view. So the, OK, I, I, I would like to stop here. And uh, regarding the order of the presentations, we would like to start with David, then Jenny, and uh, finally Masahiko. So could you start, David? So please join me welcoming the speakers. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for that kind introduction. Uh, it is a real honor to be here. And I am uh, always very impressed with Australia's commitment to uh, studying Japan and the depth of the um, capacity uh, at AJRC and at uh, ANU um, in Japan in uh, social science. It's really uh, one of the premier uh, institutes in the, in the, in the world. Uh, so uh, it's a great honor for me to be here and, and have a chance to, to talk with you a little bit. Uh, so I want to talk a bit about Abenomics uh, 2.0, which is the kind of the reboot of Abenomics. And I thought that kind of one of the start points for just thinking about uh, Abe as a politician and as, as a policymaker is the political economy that I think uh, under, uh, underpins his leadership. 
Uh, what I'm showing you is uh, the cabinet approval ratings um, over the last uh, several years. Uh, and you can see uh, Abes has uh, uh, initially started uh, very high, uh, and then it declined uh, over, over time. But there's a little bit of a pattern uh, to what has happened. Uh, so as he came in, he had a series of new economic proposals, his three arrows, monetary, fiscal, and structural reforms, uh, and his popularity shot up. It then declined a bit. He then uh, appointed um, Kuroda to the Bank of Japan. It shot up. Uh, and then there were several downturns uh, that, that occurred um, uh, related to various political uh, issues, uh, in particular um, security, cabinet res re reshuffles, and um, uh, information secrecy. Uh, and then most recently, as he signed the TPP agreement, uh, it bounced back up to about 46%, uh, but I didn't have time to update this, this chart. Um, and you can kind of see that, that part of what, what moves Abe, it, Abe's popularity is success in, in economic uh, matters, and then that he, he, he then spends that uh, capital on various political issues. And I would expect that that is going to, to continue. So before we get into what I think the future is going to hold, I think it's worth um, talking about uh, what happened in the first two years. Um, obviously, there's a big change in uh, monetary policy in Japan. Uh, I think it was um, a success. Uh, you know, if you look at the period prior to Abe's uh, assuming the prime ministership, the CPI was hovering around minus 0.5 percent a year, um, and, and I think it's, it makes sense to, to focus on the CPI ex food and energy because those are not uh, prices that, that Japan can really control very well. Um, and now it's uh, hovering around 0.8%. Uh, um, and I think that, that this period of deflation is likely to have uh, ended. Um, in addition, there was a fairly substantial uh, depreciation of the yen from 80 to 120. So that's kind of comparable to what's happened uh, in, it, uh, in the Australian uh, dollar. Um, and as a result of this, although we haven't seen a lot of movement in exports, although I'll give some explanation for that in a moment, um, we have been seeing uh, tremendous current account surpluses and things like tourism going through the roof. So uh, tourist receipts have more than tripled to 3.5 trillion yen. So just to give a sense of how big that is, Japan's uh, GDP is around uh, 500 trillion yen. So this is uh, almost about a half a percent uh, growth in, in Japanese uh, GDP just to, to uh, uh, due to tourism and having just transit, uh, changed planes in Narita, you can see the shops are just full of, of Chinese buying things. Um, and um, the other piece of this is that um, the Bank of Japan, through its uh, policy, is buying about 90% of all JGBs being, being issued at this point. So just huge monetary uh, interventions occurring. Um, the fiscal policy has been a little more mixed. Uh, we've seen some tax increases that have led to uh, recessions. Um, and the deficits have definitely uh, continued and, and are, 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 um, are likely to be there for, for a while. Um, We've seen structural reform, um, and as, as I think about structural reform, uh, there are reasons to be optimistic and reasons to be uh, pessimistic. Um, you know, to some extent, uh, being an American, uh, looking at the world uh, through the lens of our broken political system, uh, what 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 seems to be happening in Japan is like is is, is amazing. It's like you know, the, uh, these reforms are being implemented like greased lightning. Uh, we're seeing TPP coming into play. We're seeing tax reforms. We're seeing corporate governance reforms. We're seeing privatization. We're seeing energy energy market deregulation. Um, so we're seeing a lot. Um, but like in any democracy, um, it's hard to change things, right? So, so if you think about you know, how big have the reforms been relative to what I would like to do if I were uh, shogun of Japan or, or uh, following this morning's um, uh, 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 presentation, if I were the uh, Nara-era 
uh, emperor of Japan, you know, I'd like to be, see Japan doing a heck of a lot more. But as a democracy that has to struggle through the different political interests, I think it is pretty impressive, uh, the set of things that have been changing uh, in Japan. Um, so on September 8th, Abe announced round two, and so what I want to spend the rest of my time on is what I think is going to happen, um, and not spend too much time on what I think should happen, uh, which is interesting to me, but not to anyone else. Um, so monetary policy. Um, I think uh, you know, the headline CPI, including, the, including food and energy, has been low, but I think it's going to rise. There's been a historic drop in oil prices. Over the last two years, oil fell from um, $117 a barrel to 42. Um, and that's been at, uh, dragging down Japanese uh, inflation. But that's going to come to an end. I, um, when oil prices uh, stabilize, I think that, it, that headline uh, inflation is probably going to go up by another 0.7%. Um, and I think that there's a reasonable chance that Japan's going to hit the 2% target uh, next year. Um, there are some big challenges um, coming down the pike. Uh, one is the China shock. What is going to happen in China? Is it going to get stuck in a middle income trap or not? Uh, certainly one of, the, one of the drags on Japanese exports has been uh, the slow growth in, 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 in China and the slowdown in, in, in China. It's very hard to know what's going on in China. I'm not sure I trust the numbers coming out of the government. In fact, I probably don't. Um, second challenge that's likely to be uh, that Japan may face is American concerns over the low yen. We've heard some sp statements from uh, Janet Yellen about this. Uh, and there, potentially there could be some pressure from the United States on Japan if, there, if the yen uh, depreciates further. Uh, the Europe shock uh, potentially, um, I think there's going to be bad news coming out of Europe at some point. They seem to be dealing with the crisis much like the Japanese dealt with the bad loan crisis, uh, essentially kicking the can down the road so you get these, these temporary bailouts that, that uh, rescue the situation for a couple, for a year or two, and then it, it's gonna come back. Um, uh, the other thing that's gonna be an issue um, uh, that, that uh, potentially could, could uh, create problems for the Bank of Japan is uh, a potential JGB shortage, and I'll get to the reasons for that in a moment, but I was having uh, lunch with uh, Governor Kuroda, and it, it really surprised me when he was uh, talking about uh, the, the concerns that they have that they're just gonna run out of JGBs. Um, and uh, part of the reason for that is many of the people holding these JGBs are legally required to hold the JGBs. Um, and this explains why it's, it's going to be very difficult for, uh, further, uh, for the Bank of Japan to, to uh, further uh, or continue their policies further um, or, or institute a negative interest rate because um, if the only people holding the JGBs are the people who are required to hold the JGBs, uh, these kinds of policies act like a lump sum tax on uh, various financial institutions. Um, the fiscal situation, um, I, you know, I have to say uh, I have been uh, much more sanguine about the fiscal situation than almost everyone, uh, but I also feel relatively uh, good that over the last uh, 15 or 20 years when I've been thinking about this, uh, we still haven't seen that fiscal crisis that people keep saying is, is, is just about to happen. So here's my very quick reason for why I don't think uh, we're going to see a fiscal crisis like, we, uh, uh, like we've seen in other countries uh, happen. So this, the headline number that everyone holds in their, in their minds is uh, gross debt of Japan, which is at 240%. But gross debt is just the liability side of the balance sheet. So you could say, well, you know, Donald Trump is not a rich person because he has a lot of debt. There's a lot of borrowing. Uh, to finance his, his investments. What usually you care about is the net debt, so this is financial um, liabilities, less financial assets, and J the Japanese government holds enormous amounts of financial assets, many of them U.S. treasuries. Um, so if you, if you look at the net debt, it's 126. Now you'll notice, or some of you may know, that that number has actually fallen. Why? Because the yen has depreciated, and when the yen depreciates, they get big gains on their uh, trillion dollars of, of uh, U.S. treasuries that they're holding. Um, then if you look at the bank, you consolidate in the, the central bank balance sheet, you get uh, the, the uh, BOJ is holding about 68% of GDP. So, if you, so you say, well, what, what share of the Japanese debt is kind of, uh, or, or net position of the, what, uh, 
what is the net position of the, of the government relative to the private sector, it's only about 58% of GDP, which is kind of not, which is not a very big number. So what does it mean if you're going to have a crisis, right? So suppose people, you know, start to get worried about Japanese uh, government debt. Well, I could imagine a crisis occurring in, in which you had some inflation and people start to lose if you're holding dollars or if you're holding uh, some of these JGBs. Um, it's hard to believe that uh, Japan with 58% of GDP uh, P being uh, in that position of 58% of GDP couldn't <laughs> raise taxes and, and deal with with um, any kind of uh, um, uh, uh, any kind of uh, hedge fund or, or 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 other entity trying to um, bring down uh, or 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 or. or uh, bring down the Japanese government. So I think the, the, the bottom line is that Japan is not Greece. It's not going to look like Greece. Um, you know, the Japanese VAT is 8%. Um, the European norm is 25%. There is a lot of potential for raising these, ta these taxes. You know, again, if this were the United States with a broken political system where it's very hard to raise taxes, I might be more nervous. But Japan has raised taxes again and again. They did it in 2004. They did it. Um, uh, under Abe, they're planning to do another 2%. Um, you know, uh, for better or worse, the Japanese public has an enormous capacity for pain. Um, and so <laughs> they will, uh, in any kind of crisis, you could see uh, VATs going up uh, much more so than you, you saw in Greece. The other big factor that makes Japan not Greece is that Japan has a floating exchange rate, which we've seen um, uh, the Japanese government able to influence. Um, and effectively, the Japanese can depreciate uh, that, the yen. And whenever they do that, that renders Japanese workers, Japanese firms much more competitive um, and also improves the fiscal situation of the Japanese government because they get these big uh, capital gains. So I can certainly see a scenarios in which you have some inflation. I can see some scenarios in which um, um, you have some depreciation and tax increases and expenditure cuts, but I don't see um, uh, a crisis. And indeed, kind of if you do surveys of Japanese um, and you ask them, uh, you know, what would you, uh, what would you like, either a 34% VAT, a 16% VAT, and a 35% uh, Social Security benefit cut, or a 10% VAT, and a 47% benefit cut, you get a lot of Japanese going with option two. Um, and um, and I think that probably if I had to do a forecast of what's going to happen, I think that's, that's, it's not going to be a Greek style crisis. It's going to look like uh, an increase in the VAT and a cut in the benefits. Um, uh, um, and probably the way the benefits will be cut is the way that they're cut in most uh, democracies, which is you raise the retirement age, you change the indexing rule, um, and so on and so forth. So if you're a 30-year-old Japanese person, um, you certainly have reason to, to worry that your benefits are not going to rise as, or be as big as you might uh, initially have thought, but uh, I don't see a, a, a crisis. Um, structural reform. So this is, this is by far the hardest thing uh, that Abe is, is trying to, to, to deal with. Um, and uh, as, we, as we heard earlier, um, one of the fundamental problems with uh, Japanese growth rates is declining uh, population. So just some, some basic numbers, the number of men over age 15 in the labor force has fallen from 85% in 1960 to 70% today. Um, and women have declined a little, little less. Um, you know, uh, Abe has been targeting raising the fertility rate. That's a hard thing to do. Um, um, there are some reasons to believe that it might, might rise a bit, but uh, I think Japan's going to be a long way away from zero population growth for the foreseeable future. Um, one of the, the, the impacts of this, obviously, are on, on growth rates and Social Security. Um, and you know, we certainly know that, that the Japan system is, is, uh, is overloaded, um, which again means that either you're going to have to raise taxes or you're going to have to cut benefits. And I think both are coming down the pike. Um, 
Second issue has to do with secular stagnation. There's been some very interesting recent work done on this, um, on how population declines uh, interact with deflation. Right? One of the big questions, if you're an economist, is you know, why is it that this deflation has continued for so long? We usually think about monetary phenomenon as short-run types of issues. Uh, we've seen uh, Japan stagnating for, 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 for a very long time. I think one of the big problems that Japan faces is that um, you have a lot of people who are uh, anticipating retiring. You don't have that many young people. So you have all these people saving money, and you have very few people who are um, uh, able to, to invest uh, in, in, in new projects and things like that because the, 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 the nature of the, because the economy is shrinking. Um, and so in order to get people to consume, you need to have very lo low interest rates, because low interest rates boost investment, and they also make it um, uh, uh, cheaper, essentially, to consume now versus to consume in the, in the future. Um, the problem is that uh, you've, Japan's hit the lower bound, so they can't really lower interest rates unless they get some inflation. And that would drive real interest rates negative, um, and I think that that's kind of one of the fundamental problems that's been, been drive, driving this secular stagnation that we've seen in Japan over the last uh, uh, two decades. It's also probably part of the reason why um, fiscal discipline is so recessionary in Japan, right? We keep hearing about um, uh, the, 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 the notion that what Japan just needs to do is raise taxes um, and if you raise taxes, that will be the solution. It'll restore confidence. But in 97, and then um, uh, uh, a year ago, when they raised taxes, what happened was you went into very deep recessions. And part of the reason for that is, is when they're raising the taxes, um, it's cutting down consumption. And the problem is uh, a lack of aggregate demand. So in order to get around this, you need some labor market solutions. Um, immigration would be a solution. I know Abe would like to push Japan in that direction, but uh, I think any major political reform, any major reform is politically infeasible. I don't even think it's really um, uh, worth spending a lot of time on. It's just, it's the third rail of Japanese politics. You'll see um, small influxes of foreign workers uh, come into Japan with great fanfare, but nothing major happening. Um, in terms of other types of labor, labor market reforms, you might, I think there may be some things that'll, do, that'll have modest impacts. So I think there'll be some efforts to improve childcare facilities. Um, I think uh, there's, there's some effort to increase female labor force participation. Um, although I don't have a lot of optimism for uh, actually uh, in, uh, uh, doing much on that. Um, I think that um, J Japanese women already work close to international levels, uh, and I think that it's going to be hard to raise it. And the other thing to remember is these things take, take decades to, to, uh, to, to implement. Um, uh, I'm running short on time, but I'm just going to uh, ask for just a couple extra minutes. Hopefully, it's okay. Um, one of the bigger impacts is going to be one of the biggest things that, 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 that could change things is uh, uh, policies that improve productivity. Um, so raising productivity will help restore fiscal balance because when you increase GDP, you tend to increase tax revenues by a little bit more. Um, and uh, here, Japan has done a number of reforms that may matter. So we've heard about TPP could, could raise Japanese uh, income by 1% to 2%. But this, is, again, is going to happen over maybe a decade. Um, reducing discrimination against women is not only good morally, it's also good economics. Uh, because if you start hiring the best person for the job instead of the best man for the job, you tend to get better workers. Um, you know, in the United States, where we have some estimates of this, raising um, uh, elim or li reducing, Im uh, excuse me, reducing discrimination tended to raise productivity by around uh, 0 0.1 to 0.2% per year. That's not trivial. Um, and so that's something that I think uh, Abe is definitely trying to push forward. How successful is hard to know. Um, a lot of reforms have impacts that I think are very unclear. Uh, the corporate governance re reform, Mm, I don't know if that's really going to do much to, to, to allow two outside directors on a board versus 
versus um, uh, the norm of, of close, to, close to zero. Uh, I don't think GPIF reform will have much of an impact on productivity. We can talk about that later. Uh, let me just finish up with my bottom lines. So I think uh, quantitative and qualitative easing by the Bank of Japan is going to continue. I think there's going to be some increase in inflation. I think that it's possible that the, the yen may def depreciate further. Um, and again, I think the mechanism uh, for what this is going to do is it's going to drive down real interest rates um, into negative territory and boost investment and consumption. Uh, I think uh, Japanese growth is likely to rise as the, as the yen stays low. Um, I think it also is going to have a salutary effect on wages uh, because uh, workers get uh, part of the profits and profits of exporters have been uh, quite high. I think the fiscal situation is going to be uh, a problematic uh, for a while, um, but I don't expect it to end with a bang. It's going to end with a whimper. Uh, you're going to see inflation and you're going to see people stuck holding uh, either JGBs or, um, uh, or cash and they're just going to lose money. Um, we will see taxes rise. We will see benefits fall. Um, and again, structural reforms, they're great. Uh, it's like exercise, but you should expect them to have effects over the long run, not, uh, not in the you know, one to two year uh, time frame. Okay, I'll stop here. Thanks. Okay, thank Thanks very much. Um, let's see if we go, yeah. Okay. Um, look, I'm going to be very brief, partly um, because I knew that the previous speaker, and I'm hoping the one after, were going to do a fantastic job of telling you what is going on in Japan, and you don't need me to tell you that. Besides which, most of the people in this room can hear me talk any time, and you can't hear these other two people talk, so I'm going to be the sandwich meat, very thin. <laughs> Um, but there were a few things that I wanted to say. Um, now, as you expect, of course, I do have views about abenomics and what is going on in Japan, um, so happy to answer questions about that. But I was asked to talk really about what the impact will be on Australia of what's going on in Japan, and so I just wanted to say a few general things uh, about that and then perhaps to give you uh, a slightly different perspective. So clearly the things that matter broadly for Australia are um, what happens to Jap Japan's growth trajectory. So if David is right, we gradually see growth. That will have some knock-on effects as it does to all of, of Japan's trading partners. Um, the other thing that matters, of course, is the value of the currency. So if the yen continues to depreciate, we get some competitive pressures there that um, will have some impact on our likely penetration into the Japanese market. But our currency is probably keeping more or less pace with Japan. So the relative exchange rate is really what matters in that context. Um, and the other things that will in influence are really whether TPP, if it is ratified, has elements in it that are going to take the relationship to the next level. And I'll talk a little bit in a minute about what I mean by that. So TPP has in it really pretty small tariff gains. The amount of most of the trade that is covered by TPP is already pretty close to uh, zero or low tariffs. So the big benefits, if they come, are not coming there. They're going to come from the new elements that are in TPP around service trade, around investment agreements, and around um, other sorts of market access, if those make it through the ratification process in each country. Um, then I, I think the other thing that is important for Australia is what happens to Japan's energy policy. Um, and this would be really a session on its own. And perhaps next year's update, we might think about actually looking at where we are on energy, because right now it's hard to tell which way Japan is going on energy. Perhaps <coughs> our next speaker will say something about that. But um, if uh, if nuclear power doesn't come back online and Japan remains more dependent on fossil 
or energy uh, than it was expecting to. Uh, Australia has a role to play in that, but of course um, there is now a plethora of other sources of energy from other destinations around the world, and uh, the US um, shale, oil, um, a variety of other sources coming on stream mean that the the preeminence of Australian coal is not what it, it once was. We obviously have LNG projects underway here. So all of those things are important. But what I really want to talk about a bit more is not a macro perspective. So what we normally as academics are interested in is trying to understand how the Japanese economy works and what we learn about uh, the macroeconomics of an economy that's facing some problems that are very similar to us and to other developed countries and some that are very different. And David has given you, I think, a very good explanation about why Japan is so fascinating from that point of view. But academic views on economies are a kind of esoteric and rather small, you might even say unimportant, <laughs> element. What really matters for economies is what business does and thinks. And so one of the things that I thought I could add for today is because I've just come back from Japan where I was at the Australia-Japan Business Cooperation Committee meetings with the counterpart Japan-Australia Business Cooperation Committee, which brings together a big group of very influential business people in the bilateral relationship, that made me think about what are the issues that the business community is talking about with respect to the Japanese economy. And in some ways, um, they are different. And to me, the difference was pretty interesting. So my takeaway from that meeting and the perspective that it gave me um, was that there are a couple of things that businesses are concerned about which are similar to what David and I um, and other academic economists are interested in. And those include the labour market and the outlook for wages. But there are some, a whole lot of other things which I thought that what was interesting was that they were not on the agenda. You know, it's the dog that doesn't bark. What is it that they are not talking about in public forums that tells you something about what they are really concerned about? So, taxes, tax reform, hardly any discussion. And I, I have a version of why that might have been. Um, inequality, not very much on the, on the radar. Uh, public debt, not very much on the radar. Immigration, not really being discussed except as a, um, you have to say something about diversity and internationalization of your workforce because that's what you have to say. But actually, no plans to do anything very much. <laughs> what I thought was going on. What was a very big um, topic of discussion was political stability. So what my sense is that the Japanese business community is very relieved to see Prime Minister Abe win the next, the, win the LDP leadership again. And they see that as more or less a guarantee in unless there's some really big disaster, of three more years of fairly, fairly stable political um, environment. They don't care very much. I mean, they're realistic and can see that the chances of getting very many big economic wins in three years are not very great. That doesn't matter nearly as much as having political stability matters. Just don't change policy too much. Slowly is fine. So, the labor and wages definitely is on the agenda. And the reason for that is that there is a sort of curious puzzle about Japanese macroeconomy at the moment, which is that although growth is picking up, although unemployment is falling, there is a fairly strong employment picture, there is still relatively little increase in real wages. And that's good news for business, of course. It's not actually, in a macro sense, all that good news because that may, may mean that consumption doesn't grow. But currently, it does mean that businesses are not yet facing wage pressure. 
And um, the consensus view, I think, is that that cannot actually last. This is a tight labour market in Japan. That is part of what an ageing workforce means, actually. That if you are going to then hire a decreasing, from a decreasing pool of young workers, you would expect to have to pay them more. At the moment, that has not happened. And so that's a tipping point that businesses are watching. At what point does the labour market tightness begin to, to create rising wages? And of course that feeds into the scenarios um, that David has discussed about the forecast for inflation because inflation is not only driven by monetary policy, it clearly is reflecting underlying uh, labour market conditions. So that's my take on what the business community was talking about and as I say there are a number of things they just we're not talking about taxes they are trying to dodge a tax bullet everybody can see that tax reform is needed in Japan nobody wants it to be their part of the tax spectrum um, and so it's just easier not to talk about this there is a debate which David didn't talk about very much which is if you're going to have to raise taxes, which clearly you will have to do, are you going to use the consumption tax or are you going to use income tax? What is not being discussed is are you going to reform the corporate tax system in such a way that you actually increase your tax take from the corporate sector? Now Japan at the moment has a high, on paper has high corporate taxes. Um, many companies in Japan, like everywhere else, manage to not pay their taxes one way or another. Um, so there is capacity there, but the focus in the discussion is on will it be consumption tax, will it be income tax, and the corporate sector is staying very diplomatically, politely quiet on that subject because what they do not want is anything that, that actually increases the tax take from the corporate sector. Now. What does that translate into? Well, look, there are a lot of things that I think it can translate into, but one of the, one of what I wanted to draw your attention to is that I think there is some good news for Australia in the fact that the Abenomics is going to be very slow to revitalise the Japanese economy. And this comes from a number of elements of the relationship. One is that actually our exports are, at the moment, don't seem to be terribly sensitive to minor changes in the growth rate. And you can see that in these sli this slide here, and I acknowledge I've taken these slides from a very useful presentation given by Austrade in, in Tokyo for the meeting that I was just at. But as you can see here, um, our export trade, um, our Australian commodity exports to Japan have remained remarkably steady over a period in which Japan's growth rate has, um, has changed a lot. There, China is overtaking, but nonetheless, it's the scale and steadiness of the exports to Japan that I think is striking. The other thing is that Japan remains um, an extremely large and growing source of foreign direct investment into Australia. Okay, so we know they're number three after the US and the UK, um, and that the value of foreign direct investment from Australia into Japan has been growing over again, over a period when the Japanese economy's growth has not been steady. Um, so Japan is the third one along there. And the sectoral distribution of that direct investment into Australia has been changing over time. Mining is still there, and there are a number of very big and interesting mining uh, projects on the go at the moment. Uh, but food, finance and insurance, wholesale and retail, these are non-traditional sectors, or they're new sectors in our relationship, and they are also growing. Okay. There have been some really interesting new M&A um, 
projects on the go this year between Japanese investors and Australian companies. So the ones that made the headlines were the Japan Post takeover of Toll Holdings, a logistics company, in February this year at $6.5 billion. It was a very large project and it reflected the fact that Japanese investors, Japan Post no less, saw Australia as being a hub for a network in the whole of the Asian region. But there are others on the go too. Um, Recruit Holdings uh, purchase of People Bank in the human resources area tells you something about the nature of the relationship. This is changing. This is about the service sector. This is about new forms of connection between the two countries. Now, why do I think that this is a good news stories in the middle of Japan's basically not very good news situation? And it has to do with the position of the corporate sector. Okay, this graph shows you that the corporate sector has still a very large savings balance, positive saving in the corporate sector relative to other countries. Okay, this is Japan is the top heavy black line on the savings balance in the corporate sector uh, compared to the US and Europe. And cash holdings are enormous relative to the corporate sector in other countries. And the cash holdings picture is even clearer here. Okay. Corporate sector in Japan is absolutely awash with cash. What is it going to do with that cash when the return on equity in Japanese firms is so low? Japanese firms are looking for places to invest and they're going to be looking outside of Japan. So that is part of the explanation of why we're beginning to see this influx of Japanese investment into Australia in a whole range of new firms now or new types of venture. Now I put this partly down to changing structure of the Japanese corporate sector and here I differ with David about, and this is my last slide, so I'm about to wind up. I differ from David in my assessment of um, corporate governance reforms in Japan and how much they matter. I think they're slow and I think that they are at the moment tinkering with things that don't matter very much. Having two external directors on your board, you know, it's not going to, when the most of the board is from management inside the company and the external directors won't know anything about your business, they're not going to make a big difference. But take a look at this graph, okay. This tells you who owns Japanese companies. <coughs> well, take a look at that dotted blue line. Foreigners now own 30% of J Japanese corporate sector, okay? And insurance companies, city and regional banks, the classic old owners of Japanese companies are no longer there. Now, if you combine that change in ownership with the changes in corporate governance that are coming, not the mandated changes, but the ones that are coming because it is now possible for companies to have a different corporate governance structure, and many of the big ones are opting for that different corporate governance structure, then I think you may see a different attitude, different kinds of companies, and looking for different kinds of opportunities, which is why that pattern of foreign direct investment and relationship with Australia is going to change in response. That's where I'll stop. Thank you, Professor Jenny. So the final speaker is Professor Masaki Kotake. Thank you, Professor Fujiwara. And it is my uh, great pleasure and honor to be here uh, to speak to you. Uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm the third speaker because the previous two, two speakers have done a great job in uh, summarizing um, what the Benomics has been, and also pointing out uh, a number of very interesting and important issues. Uh, so uh, I will limit myself to uh, sort of express my assessment and um, maybe express uh, some of the, the points that uh, I um, not fully agree with, especially David's uh, presentation. <laughs> Anyway, let me uh, present my assessment of Abenomics upfront. I think Abenomics has had 
uh, a number of successes. So that, that's great. Uh, Mr. Abe has been very different from previous PMs who came and went almost every year, uh, leaving almost nothing behind. But uh, Mr. Abe has, had, uh, has left something already, uh, has achieved something, and I, I think that's great. But at the same time, uh, I'm not really an optimist. I, I'm a pessimist because the, the problems Japan is facing is so big that some successes from abenomics are probably not enough uh, to sort of turn around the sort of the singing, sinking feeling or sinking tide. So that's the sort of summary of my um, uh, in assessment. But let me be a little bit more uh, specific. Uh, Take a step back and uh, think of what was the situation of the Japanese economy before Abenomics. It was said that uh, Japan was suffering from six-fold uh, handicap. And uh, some of you may recall, but probably uh, many of you don't. So let me cite those six problems uh, Japan was facing before Abenomics. The first one was um, the yen's appreciation. Second one, high corporate tax. Third one, a delay in uh, free trade agreements. Fourth, uh, rather tight labor regulations, which were constraining the um, uh, flexible labor uh, employment. Fifth, uh, very tight environmental regulations. And finally, power shortage. This was related to the, uh, the uh, earthquake, which stopped uh, all the nuclear power plants. Now. Uh, Checking these six items, we can clearly see that some things have clearly changed. Most obviously, the yen rate has um, depreciated a lot. Second, I I'm sure all of you know that there's been a, a big breakthrough in terms of trade negotiations, which uh, Jenny was careful in repeating, if ratified, if ratified. So there's still a lot of uncertainty about that, but uh, I'm hoping that not just the direct impact of uh, liberalized trade, but also some of the approved measures can be uh, sort of driving force in terms of, for example, modernizing agriculture, liberalizing agriculture, things like that. So this is also a plus. And some actions have been taken on corporate tax, not much. Some baby initial steps have been taken. Hopefully, it will be followed through. And also, at, le at least some limited labor market uh, you know, a reform has been introduced. Now, the other two, environmental regulations, maybe these are OK. I mean, at least I'm personally OK. Uh, power shortage, this has nothing to do with abenomics, but uh, some slow process is going on uh, through which at least some of the power plants are starting uh, to be operated. Anyway, so these are the, the successes. Uh, and some of the successes uh, Abenomics has achieved. But uh, the question I would like to pose is, are, are these the only problems for Japan? And the answer is unfortunately resounding no. And uh, at least there are two uh, big problems uh, to my mind. The first one actually explained very um, clearly by uh, uh, Governor Arai, which is population aging, um, declining working population, and as a result, declining uh, potential growth of Japan. So that's a one big uh, sort of structural medium-term problem that we have to deal with going forward. A second one is huge public uh, debt. And um, I think the success of Abenomics so far has to be assessed against this backdrop. Namely, has it been successful enough? Uh, and like I said, I have to say, the answer is no by a wide, wide margin. But anyway, so let me briefly assess the three arrows of abenomics from, from this point of view. Number one, first arrow, uh, monetary policy. Fle uh, a drastic easing of monetary policy. Uh, I would say that uh, it has had at least uh, very big financial effects. Exchange rate uh, has weakened. And with that, uh, share prices have risen. And uh, long-term interest rates, which were already low before uh, Governor Kuroda's QQE, but still it has declined a little bit. So financial effects have been very visible. So that is a success. But uh, when it comes to the uh, aggregate demand effect, 
which is something you normally expect from uh, monetary policy. It seems clear that uh, you know, we haven't seen a surge in aggregate demand. If anything, the consumption has been rather weak and so on. So um, you know, uh, as a result, since aggregate demand and you know, if you subtract aggregate supply from that, you get output gap. Changes in output gap is supposed to be one of the main drivers of inflation. And if this aggregate demand part has not been that much affected by QQE, it's sort of natural that the inflation has not picked up that much. Uh, there's another factor, which is often cited, expectations and <coughs> governor. Kroda has been making a sort of a big deal out of it. And I, you know, th this part is actually very interesting from an academic point of view. And I could talk uh, longer, but I, I, I will just state that apparently this expectation channel have been rather weak, and hence our inflation uh, pickup has been uh, rather limited. So this is how I see a better mix, but uh, sorry, the, the first arrow of a better mix. But I should add maybe that actually the failure of the Bank of Japan so far to raise inflation can be a great blessing in disguise. Why? Because as long as inflation is low, but the Bank of Japan can keep on buying uh, government bonds, JGBs. And as long as uh, BOJ continues buying JGBs, the fiscal problem can be summarily swept under the carpet. So in fact, you know, Mr. Kuroda's failure can be uh, a great, uh, I wouldn't say solution, but uh, at least temporary remedy uh, so that the Japan can sort of continue and move forward without squarely looking at the problem it is facing. Okay, anyway, so that's the, the first arrow. Second arrow, uh, the first consumption tax hike has been made, but the second was postponed. And I think it's unfortunate because, um, frankly, there's no clear sort of prospect of the, the government being able to uh, put its uh, fiscal house in order. And um, I think David's analysis is, um, I mean, obviously correct in many points. <laughs> I'm not too sure about uh, his uh, way of sort of cutting the gross debt down to eventually 58%. Uh, and there can be uh, a lot to be said about that. but. Uh, Perhaps even more importantly, he said that uh, he, he presented several ways of addressing this issue. And he uh, said that 60% uh, consumption tax plus big benefit cuts might be a realistic solution. And maybe my concern is just that, namely, even a, a modest hike from 5 to 8 and then to 10 requires such uh, a huge <coughs> difficulty and also uh, cutting a uh, big cut on benefits. This is going to be, again, hugely politically dif difficult. So maybe on paper, if what David suggests can be implemented, then the problem can be uh, el uh, alleviated. But uh, having observed the way these things are handled politically, I I'm really, really pessimistic about anything major. Uh, can be taken. Anything, yeah, any major action can be taken uh, by the politicians. Uh, so, so that is a really uh, a main difference between me and David. On the third arrow, namely structural reforms, uh, here um, again uh, the, the result is mixed, and I think David summarized this very nicely. Uh, in my view, the only, I mean, all these, all the. Uh, structural policy or growth strategy measures are useful. And so they should be pursued uh, as much as possible. But when it comes to tangible return and reasonably quick result, the only thing uh, I can think of is a change in immigration policy, which was discussed in the morning uh, earlier uh, after Governor Rai's uh, presentation as well. But, uh, usually, the reaction of Japanese is, oh, it is difficult. Uh, there are cultural issues, uh, 
etc. Uh, I, I just want to uh, add one thing uh, on this uh, related to the question and answer between the, uh, the audience and the governor Rai. Um, there is a view that uh, since uh, regions are losing population, why not invite uh, immigrants to local areas? But Governor Rai said that uh, it's not just population declining, but the job shortage is in the regions. So the first step, I mean, if you introduce lots of uh, guest workers into areas where jobs are declining, you know, you can easily expect a disaster. So the first step is to create jobs, and governor's presentation had some of that, but uh, you know, the difficulty is that there's no clear and quick solution to job creation in the region. But at least one thing that sort of is hanging right in front of us, and it was all over Governor Rai's presentation, is that there is a one big growing market in Japan. All right? I mean, Japan itself is shrinking very likely, but there's one growing market in Japan, which is old age care and related medical services. And the reason why these people, I mean, there's no reason why we should keep many old people in the city. R right now, they stay in the city because the, the you know, hospitals are better, uh, facilities are better, and so on. But at least uh, conceptually, uh, local regions should be able to, should try to uh, invite more of um, older Japanese to the region. Okay, and now that requires uh, caregivers to be available in in the in the regions. But this can be um, at least um, partially covered by introduce foreign aid givers. Okay, so 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 some such combination of policies that make the whole thing feasible is necessary. And if there are enough. Uh, caregivers coming from abroad, actually uh, local young Japanese can go to uh, cities if they want to, and, but still there can be enough uh, caregivers in, in the region. Now, but what I hear, not my view, but uh, I heard this from uh, an expert, and this is related to uh, public finance, which was also asked by someone uh, after Governor Rai's presentation. Uh, this uh, old age care business requires uh, public, I mean, has to be supported by public funds, naturally. And if old people move to the, the rural cities, what happens, apparently, is that first of all, they don't have uh, income, they have retired. So they are not really um, attractive taxpayers, for, for sure. On the other hand, this public responsibility to support the old age care business, that is local government's requirement, at least partially. So from local government's point of view, it's like you, know, you invite people who don't pay tax, but you have to support them using local government budget. So this expert is arguing that uh, this, uh, this kind of um, you know, uh, old age related public finance system is flawed and you know uh, has contains negative incentives, so something has to be changed uh, on this front as well. And now, this may not be the critical and uh, uh, clear solution, but the point I want to make is that you have to combine many things. Right? I mean, the how to create jobs and how, can you combine it with immigration policy? Can you change public finance system so that there will be an incentive and so on and so forth? You know, the some clever way of combining different reforms uh, to achieve a particular uh, business model, so to speak, to help achieve a particular business model is probably required uh, for Japan to uh, you know, somehow have a successful uh, growth strategy. Okay, I stop here. Thank you very much.
think we had a really fantastic presentation, and also it's nice to have a Jenny as a meat of the sandwich between two. <laughs> okay, so the, right, so, but, uh, okay, so you have a lot of questions, but uh, do you want to have, a, do you have any comments on the other's presentation, or do you have any questions? Uh, it, okay, no, or, David, do you have one? I'm fine taking questions. Okay, so the, uh, we should have a question. So the, if you have a question, could you tell your name and affiliation first? So the Warwick first. Uh, thanks, Ipay. Uh, Warwick McKibben from the Crawford School at the ANU. Three very good presentations, very interesting. I just wanted to pick up Professor Takeda's last point and contrast it with David's point. David made the point that there was no fiscal problem in Japan. Uh, we had two, well, that was the inference. Um, we had two very distinguished Japanese presenters at the update two years ago who gave a really interesting presentation about how there was nobody left to buy JGBs because their stock had risen to such a level that all the required holdings had been bought and no foreigners would ever buy these bonds. Then the Bank of Japan came along and bought up all of the surpluses and is continuing to do this. Now, the worry I have is that the budget deficit last year was still running at 7.5% of GDP. And I think Professor Decade is right that 7.5% yeah, of GDP, as far as the eye can see, is a, is a serious fiscal problem. My, my question to all of you is, what's wrong with the following policy? David made the point, and so did Professor Takeda, that um, each time the consumption tax increases in Japan, it's followed by a recession. Now, the reason that's the case was because these were one-off increases in a consumption tax. You raise the tax, you announce, or the government announced, they may or may not do it again. Because of the political backlash, they didn't do it again. So you've had consumption brought forward to avoid the tax increase before the prices went up. And then you created a hole after the policy was, was, in, was implemented. Why not announce a 1% increase per year from now for the next 20 years, 1% this year, 2% next year, 3% the year after? That way, consumption goods in the future will be definitely more expensive than they are today. You raise inflationary expectations by at least 1%. You bring forward demand from the future to the present, and you won't have and you will have resources to then do serious tax reform because you cannot do corporate tax reform when you're running a budget deficit of 7.5% of GDP. It seems politically impossible. But combining the politics of tax reform in the corporate sector with the need to have inflation, with the, the desirability of having higher consumption taxes in the mix, could be a solution to Japan's problems, fiscal problems, inflation problems, and then you have to deal with, I agree, Professor Takeda's problem is what if Japan's inflation does rise, then what does the Bank of Japan do? Because no one wants to hold JGBs. Okay, so the first point, so that you want to okay, yeah. So, oops, one, yeah. now one. Yeah. Yes, good, okay. Um, so, so I want to be a little careful uh, about just the interpretation of one of the things that I said. So I didn't say that, that there's no fiscal problem in Japan. Um, what I, I think a better way of, of, of stating it is that I don't think there's going to be a fiscal crisis in the sense that uh, you're going to, you know, if you're sitting in a hedge fund and you're thinking, okay, you know, is there some way that I can, um, uh, you know, am I, am I going to see interest rates spike and the, the Japanese government unable to pay off its debt um, and, and, and we'll see something like Argentina? That I don't think is going to happen. Um, but Surely they've got to bring the, the budget in line, and the way that that's the only way that that, that, that can happen. We've got two basic strategies. One is is raise taxes, and one is um, uh, one is to cut expenditures. The issue is is there are many ways that 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 can be done. It will be painful. So I think I agree with Tagetasan. It's not uh, that that Japan can do this easily, but it's it's going to be painful. Um, but I think if, if what, um, uh, but the way that it will end is going to be with a whimper, not a bang, as I, as I, as I said earlier. So it's going to be um, uh, a, some, some kind of, I, I don't want to use the word default, it'll be, you know, uh, social security age being raised, it will be benefits being cut, it will be certain medical procedures no longer being covered. Um, these are all ways in which you don't get as much as you want. Expenditures are cut without government saying we're defaulting on Social Security. So there is a fiscal problem. It's just not going to turn into um, you know, some sort of uh, Latin American debt crisis. I, um, 
I think people who people will lose a lot of money um, holding either government bonds or, or holding cash, but they're not going to have great alternatives. I think the the issue with raising taxes. Well, maybe I should come back later. Maybe. Oh, okay. okay. Because he raised two questions all over all over the presentation. Okay. So maybe okay. The question this up was mainly about tax. Right. So, so I wanted to, to touch the tax. Yeah. Thing. Maybe you don't. Yeah. Okay, maybe, okay, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it a little quicker, shorter. Um, I think on, on, the, on the taxes, so certainly, you know, one way to, to um, improve the situation is raise taxes. You know, one of the things that we have to realize in Japan and in many, many countries that have been in struct, uh, structural stagnations is that the evidence is not that when you raise taxes, things get better. Things seem to get worse, right? When they did it in 1997, Japan went into a massive crisis and had a, um, and had a, a banking crisis, and more recently it happened again. So this notion that raising taxes is going to be the solution um, has a problem, at least uh, uh, in, in certain in the short run. And I think the problem is that it reduces demand, and Japan has insufficient demand at this point. Um, and I think that, that we need to think about mechanisms that will um, uh, you know, deal with this fundamental problem of a declining labor force. And so that's why I'm saying monetary policy. Inflation is what Japan needs. They need a little bit of inflation, not more taxes. Okay. Um, quick point. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, I actually agree with you, Warwick. Uh, is that? I'm not sure if it's on. It's, it's, it's yeah. on. Sure it's on when you agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, the only thing is that you're not the first person to suggest it. Um, and in fact, Hamada at Yale suggested it before the previous round of um, tax raising. Instead of doing one big hit, just go gently. I don't know the full story about why that was rejected. I understand it was something to do with internal politics in the Ministry of Finance, which is a bit depressing if that's true, but uh, because I think it makes sense. And then it's not so much about tax revenue, it is again about changing incentives to consume now or save, and it makes a lot of sense. The other thing I think that's important is that if a credible tax and spend package is perceived to be coming, not instantly introduced, then that changes the risk attached to JGBs. They then become a different kind of asset. If you can make JGBs into a low-risk, high-quality liquid asset, then other, other people, including foreign institutions, will buy them because globally we actually have a shortage of high-quality liquid assets. The Australian banking system is crying out for that kind of asset because the new regulations require you to hold them, and we have no government debt in Australia. So I think that there, there are many benefits that can come from looking like you have a credible strategy here that gives you a soft landing and not a hard one. All right. Uh Warwick's point is that why not increase consumption tax 1% per year over the next 10 years, say? And I think there's absolutely no problem with that. Itself solves a number of problems, so I have no objection. But uh, the realistic problem is that even a one-shot tax increase is so difficult, and how can you, you know, uh, make politicians, um, I mean, force politicians make commitments to, to I mean, it's not really a, uh, commitment to do that, but you put it in the law, right? So that over the next 10 years, consumption tax keep on, keeps on increasing by altogether 10 percentage point, and that is just way so difficult. And we can see that uh, from the, the recent decision to postpone the tax hike. And uh, here again, I have a, a sort of different way of looking at the, uh, the reaction of the economy after the first consumption tax hike. Uh, April of last year. Many um, e economists, especially our market economists and analysts, were <laughs> taken by surprise because they, many of them thought that uh, this uh, uh, negative impact will dissipate pretty soon. But it didn't. And that was one big reason why uh, the Prime Minister decided to postpone the, uh, the second uh, leg. But 
I would say, at least in hindsight, uh, given the, the 3% uh, real income decline, effectively, uh, it's not really a, a surprise that uh, our consumption uh, will remain weak for a sustained period of time. I think, um, you know, the basically tax increase is costly, but, you know, the situation that, that if there's a strong sense that the situation is, the current situation is unsustainable, I think politicians need to bite the bullet and get it back, including the second leg. But it didn't happen. Uh, in that sense, it was very unfortunate that many apparently had a too optimistic view about uh, consumption after the uh, tax increase. So may I join you about the gradual increase in consumption tax? So I, I'm not the presenter, but what I heard is that this is not a global opinion, but uh, maybe huge administration cost, because you need to increase the uh, consumption every, every every year, so that what I heard that there must be the huge administrative cost. So, so I don't know, but uh, I don't want to work in a tax agency where the consumption increases every year. <laughs> so, right, so, so uh, I would like to have a question, so please. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Hal Hill from ANU. Uh, David, uh, hi. hi. Um, question to you. Uh, excellent presentation, thanks. I, I wanted to draw you out a little bit more on the demographics. It seems to be a really tough issue, and you did hamper some of the options. So the migration option seems to be difficult, the pension reform option seems to be difficult, the employment, changing employment practices seem to be difficult. Maybe it's robotization is going to be the solution. But I'd like to draw you out a little bit more. One other point, and I see this, is it the new minister who's got responsibility for increasing the fertility rate? He's in the newspaper every day. At least I was in Japan last week. He seemed to be there every day. Um, is it possible there's a bit more happening on the migration front than we realise? I was just talking to some industrialists. Uh, it was in a forum involving Japan and Southeast Asia, and they said there's quite a lot happening under the radar screen, uh, and that they really like the fact that they're getting a lot of workers, in this particular case from Indonesia and the Philippines, a lot of it unrecorded, and a lot of it semi-formal permanent. Uh, and they said it's much better than, much better than you know, having Japanese workers. Sounds a bit like Australia and migration too, I guess. Yeah, um, so I, it's always hard to know how much is going on under the radar. I, I think that um, there certainly is some influx in this. You know, I think Japanese are divided on the issue. Um, Immigration is probably uh, the single best way that Japan has for getting out of its, its problem. I mean, so just to give you a, a sense of some of this impact, right? So it's well known that the American educational system stinks by international standards. Um, and the Japanese do way, way better in math and science. So then you can ask yourself, well, how come um, Americans do so well in high tech when we're all so, so ignorant about math and science? And the answer is that if you look at our IT workforce, about half of them were born abroad. So Americans you know, are hiring the best and the brightest internationally. We may not be that smart, but we know how to hire people who are. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so Japanese have a huge disadvantage because, you know, if you're just hiring, you know, the smartest male worker for your job, you've only got about 60 million people to work with out of a world of 7 billion. So that's a disadvantage. I think, um, um, I think, again, I think we'll see some influxes of foreigners, but you know, it will never be anything like what exists in Australia or Canada or the United States where you know, 15, 20% of, of the population is, uh, is foreign born. Uh, Japanese seem very unwilling to, um, to let in any significant number of, of foreigners. So maybe we'll see 1%, 2%, but I, I'd be surprised if, if it goes beyond that. Um, even though I think it's a good idea. <laughs> um, I have a proposal for the Japanese economy, which I haven't really heard um, discussed very much, which helps perhaps to make immigration more palatable. Um, and, and that is that um, there's talk about increasing inward foreign investment into Japan. But what that typically is thought to mean is um, bringing in some foreign owners into Japanese firms. And as we've seen, that's beginning to happen. But um, 
we used to hear about hollowing out of industry in Japan as being a terrible thing, that Japanese manufacturing was moving offshore to build in China and places where labor is cheap. <coughs> so if you can actually encourage foreign firms to come in and set up in Japan, greenfield sites or take over old brownfield, but actually come in wholly foreign, bring your workforce, locate in the regions, Governor Nara of Nara might think about this, you bring them in and they bring their own workforce and they commit to looking after that workforce. Um, and that makes it politically much more attractive in Japan because you know the concern is that they won't fit in, they won't, they'll need welfare and all the rest of it. So, and you have permission to do this for say the, a 10 year life of a project. And then, you know, at the beginning, the expectation would be the workers would go home and in reality, half of them will probably stay, but by then they'll be um, assimilated into Japan. Now, a program that really targeted that and said, we're going all out to bring foreign firms to do manufacturing, high tech preferably, with their workforce in the regions, you would be winning always round. I haven't ever heard anybody suggest this, somebody must have, but um, that would be my way of going with that. I think uh, what the, the person uh, who asked the question saw is, or heard is a uh, so-called skill uh, training program or internship program or something like that. Uh, it is, I understand, uh, it's being done and many Japanese firms are really dependent on them, but it's presumably not uh, official uh, immigrant workers, but it's an internship program, and as such, there are many restrictions imposed on that. Another source of foreign labor is uh, actually students coming to Japan for study. But they, I think I, they are allowed to uh, do a, a part-time job 20 hours a week or something like that, and I'm sure this isn't strictly enforced. So if you go to, uh, say, a Chinese restaurant, many of the waiters and waitresses don't speak, uh, you know, native Japanese, and I'm always tempted to ask them, okay, which university do you speak? <laughs> you <know? laughs> so the point is, uh, de facto, uh, we are already importing a lot of foreign workers. I'm s maybe not that lot, but a considerable number of foreign workers, but uh, the political decision to officially recognize the, the reality and make it legal and yeah, that sort of process is, is a, a very difficult one. Thank you very much. We'd like to have a further question, so that maybe, okay, first, Shiro, please. Hi, Shiro Armstrong from the ANU. Thanks to the panel for a really interesting set of uh, presentations and discussion uh, so far. Um, just thinking about Japan's problem of having the demographic problem of shrinking and aging population, um, I didn't hear too much from the panel on lifting productivity and the sort of supply side um, response. A lot of it focused on um, sort of magic bullet structural reforms or, or getting the macro settings right. Um, um, and what's been done so far on the microeconomic or structural reforms, um, as a lot of people spoke about, um, have been, I, I'd characterise as the politically easy stuff. Um, I maybe you disagree. Um, you know, mandating 30% of managers have to be women and, and things that are sort of flick of a switch kind of, um, without fighting the domestic political battles that I think, I believe, you need to, to be able to make markets more contestable. Um, the, the only difficult thing really has been the TPP, if that's gratified, and that's an agenda really set externally to Japan, and some, some bits will help, no doubt. Um, and this, this comes back to David's point of sort of downplaying the structural reforms, or, or you know, obviously the, the benefits will take time to be seen, um, and it's not clear what some of the reforms will do. And Jenny saying that business was uh, talking about stability, and, and um, slow is fine. Um, I guess my question is, um, can Japanese incomes, um, barring huge immigration all of a sudden, can Japanese incomes be maintained um, and even grow without these difficult political reforms at the domestic level? Very. 
take your time. This time, maybe shall we <coughs> with the river soda or yeah, yeah soda maybe because you are always defending soda. Yeah. Maybe this time, so that, uh, maybe start uh, with the uh, massage. Code. I think uh, actually David had a slide on productivity, and I broadly agreed with his assessment. Some can work, others are not really, um, uh, are not likely to produce a lot. But I, uh, so I, uh, overall, I think there's not much one can expect in terms of uh, total factor productivity going forward. But the problem is that the government is government estimates. Uh, are counting on, uh, say, 2% total factor productivity growth going forward to make uh, public finance ends meet. And that is as high as uh, the rapid growth period in Japan. And nobody knows where that much of uh, total factor productivity growth is coming. So, so that's uh, another concern about uh, uh, fiscal sustainability. But uh, if you look at the, uh, the situation differently, you know, even without total factor productivity, uh, Japanese, individual Japanese will not be uh, getting poorer. If you look at the total GDP growth number, that has to shrink as population declines. So, sorry, this isn't really a solution, but to get a, a more accurate picture, Japan's aggregate GDP should be presented along with per capita GDP, uh, just to see you know, how happier or not happier uh, Japanese are. Thank you. I think um, that last point is very important and it's one that I would also make, but um, even though average output per head of income could be maintained with slower growth and declining population, uh, distributional effects are non-trivial. And it might be that that becomes more important than what the average uh, looks like, because we know actually that, that Japan's performance on poverty and relative poverty is now looking pretty poor, pretty bad <coughs> compared to OECD. And and a big, num big part of the poorer section of the population are the elderly. Um, so that becomes an issue. How you improve that without some growth is difficult. Um, so uh, there was another point I was going to make, which I have now momentarily forgotten, and I'll come back to it if I remember. <laughs> David. Thanks. Oops. I'll talk for now. <laughs> OK. Um, so I, I, I'm coming at Japan having just watched the, uh, the second Republican debate and uh, I was listening to Jeb Bush, who's the most reasonable, maybe, of the Republican candidates, argue that the key to, to uh, his vision for U.S. success was doubling the U.S. growth rate. Um, and uh, Paul Krugman uh, correctly noted uh, that he would he should have just said triple it or even optimistic said quadruple it. So so I think there's there's you know raising productivity growth is a wonderful thing. You know I'd like to be smarter too. Um, it's hard to it's it's hard to implement. However for Japan, right, the way the right way I think to think about this is that there are many, many ways in which we can improve our growth rates. But not many ways that we can do it that will produce big gains. And I think that, that given that immigration is off the table, um, for the most part, there's one thing that Japan can do that can really have a big impact, and that is reduce discrimination against women. Um, you, know, you look at Japanese man managers and you see that only 10% of them are women, as opposed to uh, 30 to 40% in most other countries. And that's telling you that a huge share of your labor force is being um, underutilized. And they're being put into jobs that are not particularly, um, that don't, that don't uh, make full use of their talents. And it's very hard because to, to push this forward because if you ask most men in Japan, are you discriminated against women, they will say no. But yet, 
you have this this result. And I think that the way forward is is to do uh, things that that are, you know, in the U.S. we call it affirmative action, which is what Abe is doing, which is basically saying to Japanese government ministries, "I'm sorry, you've got to hire 30 percent uh, women um, this year." And don't tell me that you can't find good candidates. You have to find the candidates. And I think that that changes the equilibrium in which uh, people are used to seeing just men in all these positions. But it's going to take a long time. Uh, so I think he's got the right instincts. I think he's pushing in the right direction. I think it will, uh, you know, we look back, if, if it continues for uh, 20 years, we'll look back on this just like Americans look back on on, on uh, discriminatory periods in their history, and we'll go, I can't believe that was the, the state of the world, but it's not gonna happen you know, uh, overnight. Um, it'll be a slow, a slow and hard process. I absolutely agree with that point, and I think also my, linking with my corporate governance point earlier, um, we had a presentation at the conference that I've just been at by a remarkable woman who is on the board of a number of listed Japanese companies who pointed out that um, up until about 2005, there were two women directors in the entire listed corporate sector. It now risen to the fabulous number of 17. Um, <laughs> but it's hard to believe there aren't some more pretty fabulous women out there who want those jobs. But the point I was going to make that I forgot before was about the special economic zones. So one of the pieces of the structural reform program that is sort of creeping forward more or less unnoticed, but, but is doing things, and I don't know a lot of detail about them, but I think this is an area to watch, is, is where the special economic zones, uh, the kind of companies that are thriving in those. Um, and perhaps if we have time, it'd be interesting to hear from Governor Arai about whether those sort of programs help in the regional revitalization strategy. Are they really useful or do they just look good on paper? Okay, we are a bit of the uh, running, on top, running out of time, but we would like to have about maybe so that one, two, three. So please go first and uh, please your question, make, make your question quick. Uh, hi, uh, Angus Nicholson, IG Markets. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, you know, we've seen uh, machine orders now decline for three months consecutively in a row. Industrial production's on a multi-month decline. Uh, Japanese third quarter GDP is looking like we're heading into a technical recession. Given all that, um, how does the Bank of Japan not increase the QQE stimulus uh, at, the, at its October meeting? And then how much capacity is there going forward to, to further stimulate it? You know, we're already running out of the, the Japanese government bond market, you know, are they going to start buying provincial government bonds? And, you know, how much more can they do to really support and keep easing as we go forward if the economy is still doing so poorly? Okay. Do I think you take all the questions? Question. Okay, so, yeah. okay, so please. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Vibor. I'm a master's of IR student. Uh, the ease of business uh, uh, rankings for Japan is 29th for 2014, but there is a subcomponent in that ranking uh, which says ease of starting a business, for which uh, Japan's ranking is a decimal 83, which shows that there is uh, a lack of startup culture in Japan uh, as compared to Israel or uh, Silicon Valley. So, do you think, uh, uh, I mean, providing a stimulus to the startup culture in Japan, uh, it might uh, fuel the economics and is economics 2.0? Addressing that issue. Thank you. Okay. So, the final one? This is Carol Lawson from the ANU PhD student in Japanese law and previously Nagoya University Graduate School of Law. My, this is more of a comment about affirmative action under abenomics. My understanding is that, that um, the new targets are purely voluntary for the um, private sector and that's been negligible. Um, even appalling uptake. So it may be unnecessarily, unrealistically sanguine to think of that as being likely to create any change in the private sector in my lifetime, at least, in Japan. 
Okay, so uh, so maybe the, who would like to go first? Maybe this time, Jenny, are you ready or not? Um, I might just um, pick up that question about business startups because uh, that that certainly is still there is evidence that this is genuinely difficult in Japan and it hasn't hasn't really got a lot better um, and it is partly about uh, the regulatory structure and it's partly about a lack of uh, venture capital type of financing for small businesses. All you can say is that um, there certainly is reference made to this problem in Abenomics 2, but there are no concrete strategies <coughs> or policies yet announced as about how to fix that. Um, at the other, on the other hand, there are a large number of small businesses in Japan. So somehow or other, despite the difficulties, small startups do exist and they last longer. They are longer lived than, um, than in other countries. So I think part of the difficulty is around rapid exit. You know, try something, fail, try something new is where the difficulty is in, in the entrepreneurship culture in Japan. Uh, okay, so very quickly, I think um, on the question of uh, the recession, you know, so, so I think you're right, we, there may be another recession coming up. Um, the, you know, whether that's, it, it's hard to measure kind of the state of the Japanese economy right now because um, on the one hand, as you mentioned, we've got these declines in production. On the other hand, the labor market is incredibly tight with, with unemployment and three point something percent. Um, and uh, I think the, the BOJ is just going to have a very hard time um, doing a lot more liberalization, um, uh, or sorry, a lot more uh, uh, stimulus. Um, but you know, I think probably, and, and, and one might argue that. One of the major reasons for this decline has to do with external factors, say the slowing of the Chinese economy, rather than things that, that the BOJ can control uh, directly. Um, regarding the startup of, of a business, I mean, one of the problems Japanese companies face has to do with uh, labor market laws. Um, and in particular, uh, it is very hard for companies to lay off workers. And Ostensibly, those laws are designed to protect workers, um, and certainly, you know, if your company is going down, you may think that a law like that is, is good news. But whenever you have structural change, one of the problems is that the losers know exactly who they are, but the winners don't know who they are, right? You can think about uh, structural change in Japan or structural change in the United States, you know, um, Part of the reason that we were able to have a tech boom in the United States is because we didn't tie up all of our labor in inefficient car companies. And by letting those companies shed workers, they, that uh, ultimately creates the talent for the other types of, the other types of, of businesses. Um, Apple Computer, for example, used to be a manufacturing company. It is no longer a manufacturing company. It is a, a, a wholesale retail company. Now you could say, well, you know, on the one hand, we have the decline of manufacturing, right? You can cry about that, but what you got was Apple Computer. I think on net we're doing better, but it's the it's two sides of the same the same coin. Japan, you know, I think Abe knows that that labor market reforms are, are an important element in in creating the workforces that would be used in startups, but it is politically very difficult uh, to implement reforms that will. Um, uh, that will enable Japanese companies to shed workers um, uh, in response to shocks. Let me just say one last thing about, about the, 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 the comment about uh, women. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean that uh, the, a lot of the reforms are are uh, hortatory. They are reforms. Uh, some of the reforms are not. But you know, in terms of uh, the, the workers, the women workers in the government, that he does control. I think what he's trying to do is try to lead by example and say, look, I can, I can do this in my ministries, I can do this when I appoint cabinet positions and things like this. And the hope is that by you know, him appointing women, that, that starts to have some other 
uh, impacts, but it's going to be a tough slog. It's, you know, you look at the battles in, you know, again, in my country, uh, dealing with racism, dealing with um, women, it's not, there's no magic bullet, and it's going to be a lot of, of uh, small measures, and hopefully that will push things forward. But um, uh, you're, you're, you're right to, to be upset that things are not moving fast enough, absolutely. All right, uh, first, uh, BOJ's possible easing. Uh, and obviously, I, I don't know, you know, it's up to Kroda, but uh, given the Bank of Japan's modus operandi so far, uh, they may have to take an action. He may have to take an action. But uh, as I already explained in my presentation, I don't believe that, uh, you know, it will have uh, any visible impact on suddenly aggregate demand. There might be some additional financial impact if foreign investors or, you know, who seem to be looking for uh, another action to come, uh, use that as an opportunity to do, adjust their portfolios or take a position, and then that might have a financial impact. But uh, frankly, I don't think that is the main thing. Right now, uh, it is the main thing for you, obviously. But uh, from my point of view, uh, you know, it's almost like a sideshow uh, when it comes to its impact on aggregate demand, inflation, and so forth. Second, our uh, ease of uh, starting business. My sense is that uh, I'm sure there are uh, difficulties, some difficulties, but I don't think uh, Japan's case is particularly bad or anything. It's more like mindset of Japanese, especially young Japanese. They are not really, you know, uh, used to going it alone, taking a uh, chance, do something that others don't do. And that is what I feel by, uh, by given my limited interaction with uh, Japanese students. I'm mostly dealing with foreign students, so my knowledge is rather limited. But maybe <laughs> Professor Fujiwara has a, a view on that. <laughs> But uh, we are running out of time, so that I would like to close this economic section. But uh, luckily, the presenters will join the lunch. So that if you have any questions or comments, please contact with them individually. So that, okay, so that please join me thanking our three fantastic speakers for this session.